Hello, and welcome to the Full Circle Podcast, your source for insights into the science and art of endurance sports training and racing. I'm your host, Coach Laura Henry. It's time for Rad Reads. March was full of rad reads, and nothing that I read in March actually turned out to be a wretched read, so that was really nice. Uh, we we're going to start with nonfiction, and I actually only ended up reading one nonfiction book this month. I'm working my way through two other longer nonfiction books currently, and I hadn't finished them as of the end of March. So the only nonfiction book I read in March was Willpower, Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength by Roy F. Baumeister and John Tierney. This was recommended to me by an athlete, and it was a great recommendation. The book contains a lot of science, but the authors present it in a way that is easy to understand and really digestible. Baumeister is a psychologist, and Tierney is a science writer for the New York Times, so I think that them combining forces probably was a great idea. Sometimes doctors or medical folks or you know higher educated folks can tend to write in a way that is confusing for those of us who don't have those advanced degrees or understand the term terminology. So Baumeister combining with Tierney, who's used to writing for the New York Times in that audience, was probably a really solid collaboration. They discuss the concepts of self-control and willpower. And these are really important concepts for all humans. And in my work as a coach, they are really important themes that pop up all the time with the athletes that I work with. This is because athletes set goals and goals require a certain amount of willpower and self-control to achieve. There were so many things that I took away from this book. One of the big ones is something that I've anecdotally observed, but maybe never actually put into words like this, which is that willpower has finite reserves, much like fatigue does. We only have a finite amount of energy that we can spend in a day, and we only have a finite amount of willpower that we can spend in a day. So you get fatigued from using willpower and self-control, and therefore you have less of it to use once you've used up some of those reserves. And willpower depletion actually results in slower brain circuitry, which might actually be something that we've all experienced, but again, maybe couldn't put the words around, that as we use up willpower, our brains are actually processing information slower than they do when we're at full reserves. One of the other really interesting points that the authors talked about in the book was about the impact of glucose on willpower. I have talked a lot about how glucose is so important for athletes and that the cultural resistance to consuming carbohydrates is not a good thing for humans and how it's especially not a good thing for athletes. The brain only accounts for 2% of the human body's weight, but it consumes 20% of glucose-derived energy. So this makes the brain the main consumer of glucose in the entire human body. Glucose, which is sugar, which is a carbohydrate, is converted into neurotransmitters for the brain to use. Glucose and hypoglycemia, aka low blood sugar, impact self-control. So simply put, if you don't consume enough fuel, and especially if you do not consume an appropriate amount of carbohydrate, both in your daily diet and during your workouts, among other things, you are going to experience a decrease in self-control and willpower. You will also experience a performance decrease based on the lack of energy availability. But in the context of this conversation, it is also going to decrease your self-control and your willpower. Obviously, this has impacts on performance, both in training and in racing. But it's particularly dangerous if this occurs in a race, and especially a long course race, something like a half marathon, a marathon, a half Ironman, an Ironman. Because when you lose your willpower, self-control, and drive, you are not going to have the desire to continue, or it's going to become very difficult for you to continue. So if you underfuel, if you don't consume enough carbohydrate, if you don't consume enough calories, if you don't consume enough energy, you are going to lose your willpower, self-control, and drive to continue well in the race. Another interesting point that the authors brought up was about how willpower and self-awareness interact. And as anyone who listens to this podcast or anybody who's worked with me for a while knows, I talk about self-awareness all the time. Increasing your self-awareness increases your willpower. Self-awareness as it pertains to this discussion can be defined as comparing ourselves to the standards that are set by ourselves and by our neighbors or our peers. Self-awareness is knowing where things are relative to where they should be where things are. And I know I talk about that all the time too. We need to become aware of what's actually true. Changing personal behaviors to meet those standards that are set by ourselves or by others requires willpower. 
And so willpower without that self-awareness can actually be quite useless because if you are having this drive to do something and you don't actually understand where you are, you might be just driving yourself towards something that's either intangible or unattainable or just not relevant to your current situation. So it's really important to always be trying to foster this self-awareness. The final point that I thought was really interesting from this book was about self-control related to willpower. So perhaps paradoxically, people with high degrees of self-control use willpower less frequently than people who have less self-control. And this is because people with high degrees of self-control play offense instead of defense. People with high degrees of self-control are more organized and they arrange their lives so that they have less temptation that confronts them. And as a result, they need to engage willpower less frequently. Procrastination depletes willpower. The research conducted by Baumeister shows that people who say that procrastination is a defining personal characteristic of theirs have less willpower than folks who are not self-identified as procrastinators. So I think this is really interesting because there are so many of us who are procrastinators and it makes sense if we really think about it that if you are constantly putting things off until the last minute that you actually don't have as much willpower as somebody else who doesn't engage in those procrastination behaviors. Obviously, I think this book has a lot of applications for my coaching and my work with athletes. And a lot of the points that I just went over are things that I'm definitely going to be carrying into my work and using to help guide future conversations I have with athletes. And I think that these are good perspectives to have when an athlete is lacking in self-control or in willpower in a given situation. So I definitely think that this is a great read. I think it's incredibly interesting. I think it's a really good read, especially in this era where we are distracted and constantly cognitive switching from one thing to the next without staying focused on something. I see that daily behavior starting to carry through into athletic goals for athletes because I'm actually seeing that athletes are setting fewer goals or less ambitious goals now. And I think it's because there's an overall decrease in self-control and willpower because of how distracted we are. So I definitely think that this is a awesome book and I would highly recommend it. So I only read one nonfiction book in March 2024 I ended up actually reading a lot more fiction than I typically do in a given month. I was honestly in the mood for it. And the books I read were engaging and easy to get through. So I ended up getting through quite a few of them. The first of these was The Mystery Guest by Nita Prose. I was really excited about this book because Nita Prose wrote her debut book, The Maid, and The Mystery Guest is a sequel to that book. And I really was looking forward to reading this story. The character of Molly, who is the maid in the title of the first book is very likable. And as a reader, I definitely am rooting for her as a protagonist. I'm on her team. The author commented in the acknowledgement section of the book that she was more nervous to write the second book, The Mystery Guest, than she was to write her first, The Maid, because of how successful The Maid ended up being, her first book. And it was, it was phenomenally successful. It was number one on the New York Times bestseller list. People really loved it. I loved it. I read The Maid in a single day. And... (sighs) I have to say, while I really did like The Mystery Guest a lot, I will say I did not enjoy it quite as much as I enjoyed The Maid. And while I really liked how the narration alternated between the past and the present day in the book, Molly's relationship with her gran is definitely one of the things that drew me into both books and really made me like Molly's character. I sometimes felt that the author was trying too hard. And quite frankly, I think that the ending was disappointing and unsophisticated in some ways. So all in all, it was enjoyable. But unfortunately, as the author feared, in my eyes, it did not live up to the first book. After I read The Mystery Guest, I read the Maybe series by Colleen Hoover. And the Maybe series contains three books. The first is Maybe Someday. The second is Maybe Not, which is actually really a novella. And the third is Maybe Now. I really liked the series. I enjoyed the main characters and how the narration alternated perspectives. So it wasn't just one protagonist that we were always seeing the story through that one person's eyes. What I've learned about myself and not just from reading this series is that books that feature music lyrics as a part of the narration are not something I really like. A memorable example actually would be Suzanne Collins's The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. I did not like that book and a lot of it was because there was so much music written out throughout the book and I just didn't do anything for me. And that was the same in this series. Music lyrics feature pretty prominently and are used to communicate some of the themes of the book and I just honestly want to skip over it and not even read it. I just tune out as a reader. The first and third books in particular have a lot of it and it just doesn't connect for me. Music really only works for me if I hear it or if I feel the audible vibrations from sound waves. So I've just learned in books, it just doesn't work for me. All of this being said, 
the premise of the series is interesting, and I liked that it dove a bit deep on what it would be like to communicate with someone who is deaf. So one of the protagonists, Ridge, is deaf, and I really liked having the perspective of a deaf main character. I liked that Maybe Not, the second book in the series, which is really a novella, told the story of one of the supporting characters for Maybe Someday. And some of the timelines in Maybe Not overlap with Maybe Someday, and some of the scenes are actually exactly the same. So it was really interesting to see a different character's perspective of a scene that I had already seen scene play out in the first book. I thought that maybe someday the first book in this series was totally good as a standalone novel and that it didn't need a sequel. And honestly, I actually felt that way about The Maid by Nita Prose. But that being said, maybe now was a nice sequel that explored other characters for maybe someday while still looping the main characters from maybe someday in. And I liked that the narration in maybe now was for multiple characters, not just two, like in maybe someday. And I feel that it really tied up any loose ends that were left in maybe someday. So all in all, I think that this series was quick, easy, and enjoyable. The next fiction book I read was Magic Hour by Kristen Hanna. I liked this story a lot, and I especially liked the character of Alice. This is one of Kristen Hanna's older books. It's from the mid-2000s, if 2006, if I'm recalling correctly. And I really like Kristen Hanna's book, so I was interested to read this. It was really well paced right up until the climactic scene, and honestly, it felt a little anticlimactic, a little rushed, and a little simplified to me. Other than that, though, I really enjoyed getting to know the characters of Magic Hour and getting to see this story on fold. And the premise of it is a bit of a mystery suspense. And it's about a child psychologist who kind of has a shattered career and then is disgraced and retreats home to her small hometown and then ends up working with a child who has been living in the woods as a feral child for a while. So it was just an interesting premise for the book. And it kind of unfolded in a way that I didn't necessarily expect. So all in all, it was enjoyable and I liked it. Another solid book by Kristen Hanna. The next fiction book that I read was The Storied Life of A.J. Fickery by Gabrielle Zevin. This is the second book this year that I've read by Gabrielle Zevin. The first was Tomorrow, Tomorrow, and Tomorrow that I read a couple months ago. I liked that book so much I decided to read something else that she had written, and I picked up The Storied Life of A.J. Fickery. This was a very sweet and a very easy read. The thing I liked most about this book was how it was organized. Each chapter begins with a book or a short story being recommended by the protagonist, and as the story of the book unfolds, you learn who he is recommending them to and why he's recommending these books. And each recommendation that he makes ties in with what happens in the chapter that it proceeds. So I thought that was a really interesting thing. You could kind of foresee some themes that were going to be popping up in that next chapter if you were paying attention to that book recommendation that the protagonist was making. And I thought that that was a really creative way to tell the story. And I also thought that the entire story of the book was a really creative way to showcase a love of books. And it just was a really different type of story. It it features a protagonist who is a bookseller in an island town. And it, again, much like Magic Hour, kind of unfolds in a way that you don't really know where the story is going, but then I ended up enjoying it along the way. So overall, I would say that I am now a fan of Gabrielle Zevin after reading two books of hers that I really was engrossed in and really liked. The final book I read in March 2024 was Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus, and I loved everything about this book. I cannot think of a single thing I didn't like in this book. This is probably my favorite book other than Willpower that I read in March of this year. I loved the premise. I loved the main characters. I loved the story. I loved how the story was narrated. And I most especially loved the character of 630, which I'm not going to spoil for you if you're going to go read it. So just read the book and I dare you to dislike 630. It was really original, this book, and it was really engaging. And I thought it was such an incredibly well-written debut novel. And this is a debut novel, so it's all the more impressive in my eyes because of it. It's a story about a female chemist who is living in the late 1950s, early 1960s, and how her life unfolds at that time period, trying to be a woman of science in an era that really favored males in that field. Just a really, really interesting book. I was recommended this book by several people, and I was kind of nervous to read it, honestly, because sometimes when people talk about a book a lot or they really build it up, it's just not as good as everyone says it is. And that was not the case for this. 
this definitely lived up to the hype. As I was reading it, I was looking forward to getting back to reading it. So every time I'd put it down, I'd be like, oh man, I can't wait to continue reading it the next time I pick it up. And each time I had to step away from it, I was kind of sad. And I just really looked forward to coming back to it later. So that to me is one of the hallmarks of a good book that when you just are so looking forward to reading it and want to continue with it. So definitely go read Lessons in Chemistry if you're looking for something interesting, creative, and engaging. And like I said, just see if you don't love 630 as much as I did. I hope that you enjoyed hearing about the rad reads that I had in March 2024. If you'd like to learn more about the books that I discussed, there is a full list of them all in the show notes. I hope that this coming month in April, you discover a book that you can't put down. Happy reading. That was another episode of the Full Circle Podcast. Subscribe to the Full Circle Podcast wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. If you like what you listen to, please be sure to leave us a rating and review as this goes a long way in helping us reach others. The thoughts and opinions expressed on the Full Circle Podcast are those of the individual. As always, we love to hear from you and we value your feedback. Please send us an email at podcast at fullcircleendurance.com or visit us at fullcircleendurance.com backslash podcast. To find training plans, see what other coaching services we offer, or to join our community, please visit fullcircleendurance.com. I'm Coach Laura Henry. Thanks for listening.